My people, welcome back to your favorite You and I talk show with Luis Uacho. This week, we're going business. You see the suit? Okay, stay tuned. <laughs> my people welcome back to you and i today shen gibson thank you so much for being here it's great to be here thanks for having me yeah you nice suit <laughs> thank you like a, a real business person and let's tell people right away that you are on the forbes.com list number five top 30 sales people in the world yeah top 30 social sales people in yeah. the world was and it was a surprise actually uh i, I really just always out there creating content, uh, engaging community. Of course, I've written a few books, uh, and I'm actively involved in numerous online networks of sales professionals and authors. And little did I know, or some of my peers know, there was an independent social media monitoring agency looking at all our activity. And so then all of a sudden we were notified we were on the list. And wow. so it wasn't like a contest or anything like that. Yeah. They just profiled us. So You it was didn't even cool. know how great you're doing. No, I was actually rather surprised. I think yeah. maybe they got me on a day I was really <laughs> noisy. I was posting a lot of Instagram photos or something. I have no idea. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's how, that's how it kind of evolved. But a ton of stuff has spun off from that mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how did you find out? Do they send you an email? Oh, you're on Forbes.com right now. Yeah, an organization called Kite Desk, which is a software company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like a social CRM. Mm -hmm. They actually sort of paid to have the whole study done, and then Forbes exclusively published it. And so Kite Desk's PR team contacted me just before it was released, saying, hey, by the way, you're on this list. Wow. And then they did a series of webinars uh, and other things with some of the other authors and myself uh, that were on the list, and it really, almost for an entire year after, mm -hmm. they kept us busy. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's how it kind of started. Um, I mean, I got involved in the social selling space long before it was called social selling. Yeah. So, yeah, it was interesting. <laughs> so how did you get started, and why did you go into this uh, industry? Well, uh, really, from birth. Uh, my, <laughs> my father is a sales... You were sales. born sales. I was. I, my father uh, was one of the first professional speakers on the circuit in North America in the late 70s. Mm. Uh, he's still active today, all up through Africa and the Middle East, doing seminars and conferences. He was just in Iran. And, uh, and so uh, that was a family business. And so I started off on the phone selling seminars uh -huh. when I was 16 years old. No one had a night. I had this voice when I was 16. Wow. So no one knew they were buying $5,000 seminars from a kid for their conference. And uh, that's how I started. Yeah. And then when I was about 18, uh, some guy called me up and said, hey, uh, you know, what does it cost to have Bill Gibson come and speak? And I said, well, it'll be $5,000. He said, what do you got for $1,000? And I said, me. Yeah. And so I said, hey, Dad, I got my first gig. And that's, that's how I got my first speaking gig. Uh -huh. and, and then I really stayed in the sales training space mm -hmm. for... Uh, well, I've been in the tra sales training space for 22 years, um, but in the early 2000s, um, when I got back to Canada, I lived in South Africa for a couple of years, um, I needed to start my own business, a sales training business, but I had no budget. Yeah. So I did fax blasts <laughs> and then internet oh, marketing. back in the days yeah. with the fax. <laughs> internet marketing. That was social selling back in the day, right? Yeah, fax yeah, blasts. Yeah. And then, um, but then I started blogging and podcasting, or blogging in 2002 and podcasting in 2004. And then all of a sudden, my clients started asking me to help them with their digital work mm -hmm. and their social media space. And I'm like, I'm a sales trainer. Yeah. I'm like, no, we want you to help us. Yeah. And uh, then I wrote a couple books on it. Um, and One of them called Guerrilla Social Media Marketing. That's right. I, I co-authored that with uh, the late uh, Jay Conrad Levinson, mm. uh, who's a good friend of mine, a mentor. And uh, he was the sort of the father of guerrilla marketing. He, yeah. he coined the term. Yeah. And so that was an incredible opportunity. And just before that, um, I co-authored a book with another Vancouverite, a Stephen Jagger, and the book was called Sociable. And yeah. that book is the, really the one that put me on the map from a speaking perspective on social media for sales professionals and yeah. entrepreneurs. So what is it? Uh, what is it exactly that you would do for these companies? Uh, it depends on the company. Mm -hmm. You know, it really does. It, it's where um, I'm kind of a unique in the marketplace where I have both a very strong sales performance, sales training background, mm -hmm. um, married with uh, a digital agency background, really. 
So, you know, depending on your business challenge, I can, I, one of them is actually staying focused. That's my challenge. Uh, and so where I love to help people mm -hmm. is really in social selling. Mm -hmm. So equipping their organizations to use, use social media and social networks to engage customers and build relationships. And mm -hmm. that's the, the core area I like to focus on. And I also just love old school sales approaches. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, I've got a local car dealership as a client and, and love working with their people just on one-to-one -one communication skills. Yeah. So, Do people understand yet that social media can be used for selling? They do. I think that it, what it's misunderstood how that might work. Mm. Um, and I think it, it's misunderstood the same way marketers have and continue to misunderstand social media, is they believe that social media is just another channel they can yell at the world. And if they're not being heard, they should yell louder and more than their competitors. And yet the real opportunity is one-to-one. -one. Is, yeah, I've got great content, let's say, and I'm pushing it out there, but then you interact with it, so I thank you, mm. personally. Yeah. And then I interact and I have a dialogue, and then eventually, Steve Jagger and I wrote Sociable, it was about using the internet to get off the internet. So eventually, I want to meet you in person or get on the phone or do a Google Hangout and mm -hmm. deepen our relationship. And so I think that part of both social media marketing and social selling, we're all trying to figure out how to automate and mass connect uh, when what would, an, what would 20 new really good customers do for your business this year? And, and most people, they're worried about 100,000 Twitter followers, and my thing is measure your success on the number of really good relationships with your target market. Oh, so. you know, that's a very interesting view because people are thinking that it's, it's just to socialize, yeah. but you're actually using it to connect, make real life connections through socializing. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to take a short break and come back and keep talking about that. You and I talk show with Luis Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uachu.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back. So you are also a great speaker. Thank this you. Is. I appreciate that. <laughs> this is also the other thing that you do. Yes. Um, so from starting from the thousand dollars, getting paid the thousand dollars, right now, can you tell people like approximately if somebody wants to hire you as a speaker, sure. what should be their budget, uh, and yes. then how how you got to that, and people who are looking wanting to do what you do? As a published author, typically a bona fide published author who can present, yes. some you don't want to let near the stage, yes. uh, but it also goes fair. A lot of speakers who can't write either. So you know, if you can marry both, it's great. You're typically starting at about 5,000 for a keynote speech. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I do that in Canada, that's what I would charge. And if you go down to the US or anything international, I, I charge a bit more because there's a lot more involved to get down to the US or get to Malaysia where I spoke in Dubai this year recently, for instance. And, but that's typically you know, what you'll pay for most keynote speakers. That's where you start. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it goes up. Mm -hmm. it, it goes up you know, quickly. Is that like a, a one hour keynote speaking? Do they fly you there? Yeah, they fly you there. Mm -hmm. they, you know, they put you up in a hotel. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a lot of beautiful cities from the inside of a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so that, you know, that's one aspect of it. Uh -huh. um, and I think when you bring in um, a really good keynote speaker for a conference, the reason why you're doing it is you're not just paying for the knowledge. You're paying, paying it. You're paying for the experience, uh, both the experience that the audience is going to have because they're entertained and they're engaged, but plus you're not just paying for the hour, you're paying for 20 years of marketing sales experience being delivered, right? Yes. And so that's really what you know a great thought leader or expert will deliver. Um, and in my case, um, I had some you know classic sort of what I'd call speaking training from some some really great mentors like my father, Bill Gibson, and Dr. Dennis Covier, and Jim Jans is another example of three great speakers who, when I started off, um, you know, it was terrifying having them watch me because they were like, <laughs> I looked up to them, but they really, they beat me up a bit when I was younger, but they yeah. really helped me polish my craft. Mm -hmm. So that was a, a big thing for me was mentorship when I started off, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. And, and you know, um, a lot of people are afraid of speaking. Mm -hmm. Speaking is like the number one fear I've heard. Speaking in public is like number I'm one fear no after listening. death. <laughs> it is. I, people I've fear heard that. dying and then they fear speaking in public. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have fear before you go on stage or have sure, you ever Sure, absolutely. Had that? Mm -hmm. And actually, I think that um, uh, if you're a rock climber, a world class rock climber who free climbs, they would tell you that fear keeps them alive. Oh. 
and it keeps you focused, and it keeps you performing optimally, and it makes you double check and triple check your handhold before you move forward. And you know, is my foot really in that crevasse properly before I move up? And speaking is the same, is that most great speakers will tell you they're nervous, but part of it is managing that energy in a positive way. Uh -huh. And so uh, my mentor, actually another mentor of mine, uh, Fred Shadian, uh, who's a martial arts teacher, but also really an NLP master, one of the things he taught me um, was What's how NLP? neurolinguistics programming, oh. and it's really the study of of how um, the language of the mind, in essence, um, and and how physiology impacts emotions. So one of the things he taught me is sort of a tip for anybody who's presenting but gets nervous mm -hmm. is the difference between being terrified and being excited is just the way you're breathing. Oh. So ter being terrified often it's in your throat. Mm -hmm. You still got the heart rate and the adrenaline, which is uh -huh. the same as being excited. Uh huh. But then all of a sudden, if you can slow the breathing down and bring it into your diaphragm and then use that energy, um, I find that even if I'm a bit nervous, I'll stammer a bit in front of an audience, but by breathing and being centered, I can, I can use that energy to be really aware. And I think that's awareness and, and also being a bit nervous before a presentation means I'm gonna do my homework. Mm. So, I, I don't, so most speakers you will meet Professional speakers yeah. are nervous beforehand, and almost all of us have a ritual before we go on. Oh, yeah. Is so. yours like a secret, or can you tell us a little I, bit about it? Mine is actually very much um, uh, some of the breathing and centering exercises mm -hmm. I used uh, when my teacher Fred Shadian taught me how to walk on fire when I was younger. We used to do <laughs> fire walking. No way. And so it was about actually br breathing and get yourself in a peak state, but not being excited and ungrounded, but excited and absolutely focused. And so I do a number of breathing exercises and focusing exercises. Before you don't I do go on. fire walking before you go on. I would, you know, I haven't gone fire walking before a talk. I've done one after a talk before, but uh, never before. Yeah, I like how you're not afraid of your fear. You actually um, face it. You know, absolutely. Yeah, because some people you talk about fear and it's like, uh, you know, but yeah. you recognize that it's there, and then you have techniques on uh, how to face it. And managing it. Yeah. yeah. So you have that beautiful pen. I, I can't yes. help but notice the beautiful pen. This is also from your great speaking, I suppose. Uh, uh, somewhat, yes. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's actually, I got this uh, also a surprise. Uh, it was my 14th year as a member of the Vancouver Board of Trade, and I was at the annual general meeting. And uh, Henry Lee, who was the chairman of the Vancouver Board of the Trade at the time, uh, invited me up. And along with myself, um, Yvonne de, de Valone and a couple of other members, uh, you know, got a, a, an, a, a chairman's award. And this one was for 14 years of, of, of community, leader, community engagement is what mm. it was for. Um, and it really was around the volunteer work I've done. And yes, speaking for the Board of Trade and contributing to the different programs, but really just being highly involved in, in the business community and mentoring and, and you name it. And so that's, that's where that came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is it real gold? You know what, I think it's, um, I think it's, it's uh, plated. I'm not sure if it's solid gold. <laughs> um, I, yeah, uh -huh. So I, I did lose the original one, to be honest, uh, oh. and I had to replace it. So it was a few hundred dollars to replace it. So I think oh. it is real gold. Oh. Either that or they made some good money off me. Yeah, sure. it yeah. looks really great, um, you know, because you're also uh, an educator, right? Mm -hmm. Educating so many people. And then we're just going to take a short break and, and come back and talk about your educating people in Vancouver through actual schools. Yes. Nice. You and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uachu.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back with Shane, author, speaker, and educator. So tell us about your education in BC and why you wanted to do that. Uh, you mean the program we're running in partnership with Langara College? Yes. Yeah, the Langara College Professional Sales Certificate Program, um, to my knowledge, is the only fully online uh, post-secondary uh, sales program available. So it's a it's a four-month intensive program. It's yet it's at your own pace in essence. It's online. You get a webinar a month for the program, 
and we're teaching the same methodologies that my father and myself have implemented in organizations like Zurich Life or ABSA Bank in South Africa or BMW or Hub International or Ford here in Canada. So same methodologies but packaged for people who want to learn how to sell or improve their selling. And uh, you know, really for me, um, when we originally approached Langara College, we wanted to develop an academic partner uh, and they had a need. They, in their continuing studies program, they had a, a ton of people wanting sales training that was relevant in the real world. Yeah. Um, so yes, academically recognized, but tomorrow it can improve my sales. And so for me, I was actually running it in the classroom first. It was an 18 hour weekend times four weekends. Ooh. And so by Sunday, my enthusiasm to teach far outpaced people's enthusiasm to learn. <laughs> they were pretty tired. I mean, you're like, you're gonna love selling. Yeah. You know? It was a boot camp. Yeah. And then we took it online and I thought, well, uh, Lynn Kitchen from Langara College suggested uh, that we put it online. And I thought, no, people love me. They're going to need me in the classroom. They can't learn how to sell or communicate if they don't have me. Yeah. And, uh, and I guess I was wrong because we have just as many students in the program and I would say equal, if not more, success in our students' sales careers mm -hmm. taking this online program. Wow. And so it's called the Langara Professional Sales Certificate Program. Mm -hmm. and we've now been running it for, all, this is their fourth year, which I can't believe. So it's so it's amazing. Every month. Yeah. yeah. So how many students do you have? And do they still get to meet you? Do they still get to see you at any point? So we do live webinars mm -hmm. uh, once a month. Um, and so they do to connect, connect at that time and ask questions in real time. Uh, they've always got access to me through email and Twitter and LinkedIn and wherever else they can find me. Um, I also run something called the Vancouver Sales Performance Meetup which is a monthly meetup for sales professionals, monthly-ish, depending on my schedule. Yeah. But I try to get people together at least quarterly, mm -hmm. where we all come together, and a lot of my online students actually do come offline. But some of my students are in the Bahamas, and yeah. in the Middle East, and yeah. in Toronto. So these people I don't meet. Yeah. Um, but and that's a great thing about an on online course, is if you've got a connection to the internet, and a desire to win and learn, you know, you can, you can do that. So do you find that what you know and the knowledge that you have accumulated applicable here in Canada is also useful to people who are out there in the world, like the realities of the different yeah, societies? The, right? the advantage of, of our sales methodologies is that I lived in South Africa in 1997 to 1999. My father moved there just after apartheid ended in about 1995. Good timing. Yeah, and, <laughs> and there was a huge brain drain. Yeah. And there was a massive need for mentorship to help people develop their sales careers. So our methodologies were developed both in North America and in a developing world, both in large companies and micro enterprises. And, uh, and so what I like about what we teach is that it's, it works. I know it works in Africa. I know it works in the Middle East. It works for the groups I've worked with in Southeast Asia or my, uh, my South American clients. Yeah. So, but I think, you know what? People are more alike than they are different all around the world. Mm -hmm. And selling, is, selling and social media are about people. Yeah. And so I think that we put too many labels and say, oh, this won't work in Mexico. So maybe that is the Canada. question, like what is selling? And it is selling a, in every culture, it's the same because you go to the market in some cultures, it's like, you gotta be bargaining. I, you I gotta, had some you know. of my best negotiations training uh -huh. um, in markets in Thailand, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and negotiating yeah. and debating and, and, and finding a way to do it without making people mad at you, which was fun. Um, and uh, Trevor Green and I wrote a book called Closing Bigger over a decade ago, uh, Captain Trevor Green. And um, w in that book, we define selling as creating an environment where an act of faith can take place. Creating an environment where acting faith... Where an act of faith can take place. Oh, where an act of faith can take place. And faith is based upon trust, and trust is based upon credibility. Mm -hmm. And around the world, trust and credibility, no matter what you're selling, uh, f you know, really builds the foundation. And I think that's where people miss, they talk about relationship selling, but you can really like someone, mm -hmm. but you wouldn't trust them to fix your car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? You wouldn't give them a check for a million dollars for the CRM for your company. Yeah. So, yes, relationship is important, yeah. but trust and credi or tr credibility in, is really key, and so is trust, mm -hmm. in order for people to take that leap of faith to do business with you. Mm -hmm. And so that's really, that forms the foundation of both my sales programs and my social media marketing programs, mm -hmm. is the end goal mm -hmm. is to get, create that environment. Nice. And so around the content you create, how you interact, um, and then how you deliver your service or your product. Yeah. That's so through the whole cycle. But credibility is not something that you can teach. Credibility is something that the person has to have on their own. Uh, yes and 
Uh, I would agree with that, yeah. but there's also there's many aspects of credibility that can be taught. Um, so Such if you look at per personality profiles, mm -hmm. so I look at my accountant who's a very analytical guy, mm -hmm. and if you went into his office and you were a little bit late and you told a lot of stories and you weren't very specific yeah. <laughs> and you made a lot of noise and laughed a lot, yeah. he would think you're not credible. Yeah. But if you came to my office, yeah. I would think, wow, you're really awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because of different personality styles. Yeah. So credibility is subjective. Mm. So in selling, there's certain things like being trustworthy and keeping your promises that are foundational. But then there's other aspects of credibility which are really about me understanding you and then adapting my communications style to match your buying and credibility style. Oh, so if someone wow. says, what's the best sales process? My thing is the best sales process is whatever one you follow to buy. Uh -huh. And so adapting to you as the client. And sometimes I need to lead you. I see, so as a salesperson, you can't have one universal pitch for everyone. You're supposed to adjust your pitch according to who you're selling to. Absolutely, especially in large account management and big deals. Right, um, But even if you're buying a pair of running shoes um, and you come in, that person's ability to identify if you're in a rush or not, if you're looking at those Nikes because they look awesome, uh, or you want a really great pair of trail running shoes. I mean, that's all, you've got to shift your, your approach with the individual. Aha, uh -huh. all right, let's take a short break and come back, my selling people. <laughs> You and I talk show with Louise Uachu. We love you, the authors, the musicians, the comedians, the entrepreneurs, and all other talented and inspiring people. Please contact info at uwachu.com to be a guest on the show. All right, my people, we're back with Shen Gibson, teacher, author, speaker. Uh, so let's say that you were also involved with the uh, Social Media Mastery Conference yes. in Vancouver. And the, your speech is about the exponential influencer. Yes. Did uh, I say that right? You did, the, ex <laughs> the exponential influencer. Uh -huh. uh, and it was, you know, sometimes I just pick a title. You know, mm -hmm. and I was thinking, what does it really represent? And, to be honest, you know, everybody in the startup world is talking about being exponential, having exponential growth. Mm. And I thought about how does that apply to influence? And really what it's about, uh, this talk I'm going to do, is about how do you create a magnetic brand? So how do you create a personal brand, online and offline, where people come to you and want to do business with you? Mm. And so that's really what I'm going to cover. And you know, this is something that people want to know yes you know because anybody any entrepreneur who's creating a business they want people to come mm -hmm. so what are, what are some of the tips that, that you can give you be giving people the, I've got a model on what we call thought leadership uh -huh. and establishing yourself as, as a thought leader in within your area of expertise so I'm assuming that you're legitimately an expert in a certain area so mm -hmm. that's gonna I'm gonna assume that yes <laughs> uh, it's not just like positioning yourself as an expert and not delivering which yeah. is another problem I see in the marketplace yeah. but actually genuinely you're an expert you've got something great to offer the marketplace you might be an expert at selling cars or delivering awesome cars or you might be an expert at educating for mm -hmm. instance right mm -hmm. so it all depends mm -hmm. or a great lawyer for mm -hmm. instance mm -hmm. and so there's three aspects of becoming a thought leader online and the first one is creating and curating really fantastic relevant content for the specific market you're going after that speaks to where it hurts or what their dreams are. Mm. Now, a lot of people just write content, write content, write content, and they're like, no one's knocking on my door <laughs> because no one knows you exist yeah. yet, right? So yeah. create and curate content, and the next part is having great conversations with that specific market around those topics. So that's the two-way aspect of Twitter, of Facebook Live, mm -hmm. of a blab chat, mm -hmm. right? Or holding an event and getting everybody offline to meet you, right? And then the third part is building community. Mm -hmm. And that is being committed to something bigger than your brand. And I think that's really important. And so I look at Ricky Shetty from his Social Media Mastery Conference, and what he's done is his brand is Daddy Blogger, mm -hmm. right? And it's a fantastic brand, and he's, it's a very specific niche. But what he's done is he's pulled together all these people from the community to do something bigger than his brand for them. So that's a good example of community building. And so if you, with your brand, I'm going to talk about how you do all three of those things effectively wow. in your business. Uh -huh. um, and so, so that's really the, kind of the gist of the presentation. Um, and then I'm going to, from there, move into the new sales funnel, which is how content, uh, interaction, and connection lead to eventual consent. 
wow. to market to. Uh -huh. And most people, what they miss in social media is we connect and I pitch you. Yeah. Yet that's like going to a networking function and before you even open your mouth, I stick a business card in your face. <laughs> and then when you're looking at that, I shove a brochure in your pocket uh, and then I run over to the next person. Yeah. And you wouldn't do that at a networking function, yeah. but people do it all the time on the internet. Mm -hmm. And so it really is understanding the natural cycle people go through before they even call you mm -hmm. to evaluate whether or not they want to do business with you. Oh, nice. And then how to build a funnel based upon credibility. Mm -hmm. yeah. So a great salesperson is not the type of salesperson who goes in right away for the sale. No, actually, um, I was reading uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's team, uh, hashtag Ask Gary V, if it is, that's the name of his book as well, sent me a copy of his book recently, and I read his book, and, and one of the things I loved in the book when he talked about selling is, is that most people on the internet try to close too soon. Ah. And now he's an uber closer, and yeah. he pitches all the time, yeah. but it really is about adding value, building credibility and relationship, and then, you know, I think gentle trial closes at first, and I think it's way better to test the waters than it is to go for the deal and lose the relationship. Mm -hmm. And I think that too many people want to automate everything and pitch everyone mm -hmm. uh, while they sit on the beach. <laughs> and you know what? That's just not reality for most people. Yeah. Especially, it's not the reality for most people depending on the market they want to go after. Wow. You know, I really like that you take it personal and you want to make the connection and you want to go beyond selling and you actually want to create a community Absolutely. and make an impact. Yes. Wow, Shen, thank you so much for being thank here. You. It's short. Do you have anything that you want to tell our audience before we let you go? It's short, but it's been so great having you. I, I would just say whether it's sales mm -hmm. or it's social media, it is about creating an environment where an act of faith can take place. And if you do really good work and you create really great content and you deliver, uh, then all of these things work well. So it is about building a personally authentic brand in integrity. And I think that that foundation is what makes great sales and great social media work. Ah, all right, I get it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, my people. Authenticity is the key. Absolutely. And then afterwards, you can make all the money you want. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Oh.